Hello everybody, my name is Fum Charco. I work for the Port Phillip Eco Center as a marine biologist and this talk is called Two Worlds Colliding, Unexpected Co-Creation and Experiential Learning Between Citizens and Science. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm presenting from, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I want to acknowledge the Boonarang people of the Kulin Nations, who are the custodians of the land and the waters where the research took place and where the eco-center is located. I acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, and I strive to uphold the connection to the land and waters that is entrusted to me. I promise not to harm the land or the children and to look after the land for future generations. The Port Phillip Eco Centre is a not-for-profit community organisation in St Kilda. We look after the waterways with our focus on Port Phillip Bay uh, and a healthy bay and healthy catchments leading into it as well. Um, RMIT approached us um, one, when they won the Federal, uh, Federal Citizen Science Grant a few years ago with their um, a project called Evaluating the Environmental Impact of Sunscreens in Port Phillip Bay. Um, RMIT was the project manager. They did all the laboratory analysis, publishing the results, all the, and uh, a part of it was social research as well. And they contracted the Eco Center to do the volunteer recruitment and management, um, citizen scientist training, and sample taking for the project. So. It was a brand new collaboration. Uh, we hadn't worked with a university like this before and, uh, and neither had RMIT worked with citizen science scientists before in this fashion. So it was a brand new project. The goals of the project um, were around the health of Port Phillip Bay and the effects of sunscreen. Um, so the question was, are sunscreen elements found in sufficient quantities to exert an effect on the Australian marine environment? And the context of this is that in tropical waters, particular sunscreen chemicals have proven to be uh, very toxic to tropical coral reefs. Um, but nobody really knows the effect in temperate waters. So, for example, in Port Phillip Bay. Uh, and since we don't have corals, uh, we don't know if there are any other effects on other wildlife. So the project goals were, first of all, measuring uh, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide nanoparticles and oxybenzone concentrations in the environment down here. So not in the lab, uh, but in the actual environment. And all of those nanoparticles and, and oxybenzone are chemicals that have been proven to be toxic to tropical species. Um, and so they wanted to measure the effects on phytoplankton in temperate waters of the bay, because we may not have corals, but phytoplankton are the primary producers of the bay. And so if there are significant negative effects of these chemicals on, on the primary producers, uh, it means that it may affect the rest of the food chain in the bay as well. Now, this project was a lot bigger than just this section that I'll be talking about today. Uh, there was also the samples were also used to look at the effects of um, mammalian skin cell lines. Um, this has to do with you know the, the chemicals um, potentially causing cancers. Uh, we don't know anything about that. Um, so they were used for that as well. And there was also a social science comp component around climate change mitigation and also uh, around researching around citizen science um, and, and uh, how citizen science uh, can help uh, scientific projects like this. Um, very interesting. So for this presentation, I want to outline two examples of challenges that the project faced when the world of science collided with that of the community. Uh, just for you to get an idea of what can happen when you are putting an interdisciplinary team together that come from very different backgrounds to collaborate on a, a big three-year project like this. So the first thing we ran into uh, was a um, project co-creation and expectation alignment issue. Um, and for that, I want to ask you a question and challenge you a little bit. So we were asked by RMIT to provide them with a quote um, based on a number of sampling days that we needed to uh, organize for the volunteers. Um, now, when somebody says, okay, how long is a sampling day for you? What does that entail? Is it a working day? So eight-ish hours of taking samples. Is it 
however long you have available daylight for taking water samples, so that's different in summer than it is in winter, or do you think it is uh, 24 hours, technically, a day? So I have a few seconds to uh, think about it. If somebody asks you, how long is a sampling day? Or what would you, which one would you choose? All right, so it turns out that the quote that we made and you know thought that we were going to coordinate volunteers for was the first one. Uh, so for the Eco Center, uh, a day is a working day. So about eight-ish hours. However, for the scientists in RMIT, a day is 24 hours because the way they set up their experiment was to for water samples to be taken around the clock for 24 hours every four hours um, to get the the most perfect results for the uh for the for the experiments obviously um and this provided a big challenge obviously because from a citizen science point of view, it was really hard to work this, right? So imagine you're recruiting volunteers and you're telling them, okay, so yeah, we need to take samples, but we need to do it around the clock every four hours, 24 hours a day. So that means there is one water sample that has to be taken at 2 a.m. Now imagine you're a volunteer and you have to get out of bed so you're at the beach at 2 a.m. You have to wade into Port Phillip Bay in the winter, eight meters in, uh, to take a water sample in the dark. <laughs> now, I didn't really think that we would be able to get volunteers for that, for those time slots. Um, and another thing was a, a safety issue, um, because one of the sampling sites, one of the three sampling sites, Rye, Elwood and St Kilda, uh, was St Kilda Beach and uh, I don't know if you know St Kilda a little bit but you know it could be a bit of a party place um, so I didn't really want to have our volunteers there on the beach in the dark by themselves taking water samples at 2 a.m while you know people are out partying and doing god knows what on that beach um, that didn't that that was just not really feasible from a volunteer uh, safety point of view um, so it was really good that we were involved in the early stages of this project design so that we could make sure that um, we could co-create the sample taking in a way that was still really good for, for the science project and for the goals, um, but also workable in terms of citizen science and volunteer management and safety. So eventually we settled on uh, doing sampling days uh, between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. And the volunteers were taking water samples every four hours in the, in the three locations. Now, another learning that popped up um, was that we discovered that the goals of the volunteers and the reasons why they participated in the project were very different from the scientists' goals from the, for the project. Um, so when I recruited the volunteers, you know, most people who signed up, they were either students who wanted to um, gather, you know, who wanted to gain uh, real environmental uh, science uh, experiments, uh, experience. So, you know, they'll be environmental sciences students. Um, but often they were just people who really love the Bay and they really wanted to help to protect it. Um, they wanted to know if, if sunscreen chemicals could potentially harm the wildlife that they love so much. So they were really in it from an environmental um, protection point of view. And they wanted to know what the results would be and if they would have to advocate for change. For example, you know, if, if there would be a negative effect, would they have to then go and advocate for uh, banning those sunscreen chemicals, for example. Now, from the standpoint of RMIT, the project was so much more than that. Those samples went a really long way and did way more than just answering that one question of, you know, is it harmful? Is it harmful for the bay? Um, an example was, um, you can see here, this machine. Um, the samples were f the first samples that we got in the first six months of the uh, of the project. They were used to calibrate a very sensitive machine, and there's only I believe there was only two of those in Australia, if I'm correct. Um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, and those machines 
had to be calibrated to detect very, very tiny, tiny traces, concentrations of nanoparticles of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide and oxybenzone in the water. Now, the whole process of just calibrating the machine with the samples took six months alone. And there was no sign of any research results yet. And that was very unexpected for the volunteers who kind of expected results to, to come pretty quickly. Um, and so what happened was that at the first volunteer presentation, it was not really what people expected. Um, you know, they, they were expecting to hear the preliminary results, uh, which was not possible because we needed way more samples. Um, so instead they heard about the calibration of these machines and things like that. So these are two slides um, that I borrowed from that presentation. And if you look at the language that's being used, um, it's very technical. Um, and even though the processes were very, very important to the life of the project and projects after this, um, it was really hard to understand for volunteers who didn't have a science background at all what exactly was going on and what the point was of, of this part of the research. Um, now, thankfully, Dr. Sarvesh Soni, who is the, the project manager and brilliant scientist, uh, who is the leader of this project, was very sensitive to the feedback from the, from the volunteers. And so he was able to adapt to the subsequent project updates and, and presentations for the volunteers to concentrate more on the topics um, that the volunteers really wanted to know about. So the learnings and outcomes from RMIT standpoint, and thank you very much, um, Professor Andy, Andy Ball for this, uh, for this feedback, is uh, in the engagement, RMIT really noticed the importance of involving all of the stakeholders in the early stages. Um, so especially to iron out those communication issues. Uh, for forums, uh, ensuring that there is an opportunity to receive feedback and advice from all of the stakeholders. And clarity, um, you know, to really make sure that all members of the team are aware of the bigger picture, not just the research program, but also the implications of the work and the potential impact that it may have. And, and what I found really beautiful feedback that we rece received from RMIT in terms of learnings is that uh, it completely, this project completely changed the way they design future science projects as well, because they realized that it was not a matter of just answering a research question and then moving on. You know, there had to be that extra feedback loop back to the community and the volunteers. And the research results were going to create a ripple effect in the community and have a real impact on the community as well and their goals and their dreams for the environment uh, and for future citizen science project engagement as well. And, and RMIT really acknowledged that and they changed a lot of the way they, they now design and, and step into new projects, which was an absolutely fantastic outcome of this. Um, and the interdisciplinarity of it is really important to really involve a team with a wide range of experience and expertise in both the planning and the execution of the project as well. For the Eco Center, the crucial elements to success were definitely co-creation of the scientific process, so managing the expectations from both sides and being involved at early stages, uh, and also the recognition and identification of different drivers uh, for the project stakeholders, you know, like volunteers are in it often in it for different reasons and you need to know those and the science communication is super important you know you need to have somebody involved who speaks both scientific language and community language and is able to act as a translator in between the two I would like to thank Dr. Sarvesh Soni and Professor Andrew Ball for involving us in this project, and also Dr. Lauren Ricketts, Connor Jolly, and Pat Bonney, uh, who were involved in this as well. But the biggest thanks is to all the volunteers who made this possible. Um, it was a real joy to work with them. Um, and I have taken up most of the time. There's not a lot of time uh, left for questions. So if you want to join me, I will put a Zoom link in the chat now and you can join me briefly um, in a, another room if you want to have more of a chat and uh, I will answer your questions as best as I can. Thank you.